Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Patrick Duckenmiller. He is a professor of geology and the director of the University of Alaska Museum of the North. He is a vertebrate paleontologist whose research encompasses Mesozoic marine reptiles and the Alaskan dinosaurs. Patrick has conducted extensive fieldwork in North America and the Arctic, including Northern Alaska, where he, um, sorry, excuse me, where he directs excavation of the northernmost dinosaurs to ever walk on Earth. He became an Earth Sciences Curator in 2007 after moving up from Montana. Dr. Druckenmiller has conducted paleontological paleontology, my brain is just losing it, my tongue, field work across much of the Western US and Canada and has active field sites across Alaska, including the Northeastern Panhandle, the Alaska Pan Peninsula, the North Slope and several locations um, throughout. Patrick received his PhD from the University of Calgary and as a fellow former Alaskan, I'm very proud to introduce Patrick Druckenmiller. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, we were just talking before the show, actually, you know, I, I grew up in Wisconsin, not too far from where you guys are based, and um, I cut my teeth in the early days collecting fossils in southern Wisconsin. Um, and uh, when I started at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for my undergraduate degree, I actually marched into the, the curator of the University of uh, uh, the UW Geology Museum. I walked into his office asking if I could work on some fossil plants and he got me going on Maison Creek. So um, that's how I really kind of began my association with museums and paleo. So, um, so there you have it. Uh, thank you for putting up with the uh, technological challenges there, but I'm glad we got it sorted out. And so my thanks to uh, Dave Carlson, who I've never met before, but he just uh, saved the show by um, managing to <laughs> assist on the technology end. So thank you for that. So uh, next slide, please. What, uh, what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is some research that we've been working on in Alaska, and in fact, in northern Alaska on dinosaurs from what's called the Prince Creek Formation. The, the Prince Creek Formation is, is significant um, in, um, in that it's, it's, it's one of the most, uh, I, how should we say, prolific dinosaur sites that actually preserves dinosaurs that lived in the high Arctic. And I'll come back a little bit more on that in a minute, but the formation and the rocks that I'm gonna be talking about tonight are from the late Cretaceous period um, the Prince Creek Formation itself actually spans the end of the Cretaceous and into the, the Paleogene, but uh, the sites that we're working at, we recently did some new uh, uranium lead dating and found out that they're about 73 million years old if you want a number. So late Cretaceous from about the late Campanian if you're into that. So our field site is located way up in the northern end of Alaska. And um, that little dot there on the map for Fairbanks is where I'm currently located. And if you're curious, it's about 15 below right now. It's, it was a pretty average temperature day here for this time of the year. Nothing, nothing particularly cold, but not particularly warm. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to fly across the tundra of the Arctic before. But if you fly across the northern part of Alaska, the area we call the North Slope, this is the area between the Brooks Range and the Arctic Ocean. And it is kind of a slope. It, it just gently slopes from the mountains all the way to the Arctic Ocean. When you fly over that area on a plane, this is what it looks like. And it's tundra and it's wet tundra. You don't walk across this stuff. You have to get around only basically by flying or by following the river corridors, which are your travel ways. And when you look at a, a landscape like this, the, the, the obvious question is, well, where the heck do you dig dinosaurs? There's no rock there. Uh, but in fact, there, uh, there is a secret, and that's the next slide. And the secret is 
you can see the underlying bedrock in places, and that place happens to be primarily along the Colville River. The Colville River is the largest river in northern Alaska. It drains a huge part of the Brooks Range, and it's powerful enough to cut through the tundra down into the bedrock and expose these Cretaceous 73 million year old rocks, which you can see here in this view. And just for scale there, there's a little red dot in the middle there. That's one of our boats. And we actually have a, a camp located on that gravel bar um, uh, that's kind of not too far away from the red boat. So this is, this is kind of what our field area looks like. And those grayish rocks there that you can sort of see dipping down to the, in this case, to the north, um, that's the Prince Creek Formation, and that's where we find our dinosaurs. Next slide. So have a good um, uh, have a good look at the photos. Anybody see a dinosaur bone? <laughs> yeah. This is your quiz question for the day. No. Okay, if you want to just kind of tap your space bar real quick. Yeah, there you go. And go ahead and tap your space bar and it'll be a little more obvious. Boom, there it is. Uh, <laughs> so that actually is a dinosaur bone and that particular bone, next, next slide. That particular bone is actually um, sticking out of something we call the Liscombe bone bed. And for a long time, the Liscombe bone bed was mostly what we knew about dinosaurs from this area because this layer of rock is actually packed with thousands of bones of a species of duck-billed dinosaur. Next slide. Um, we've excavated from that site for many, many years. Um, most of that excavation was done before I started at the museum. And eventually, um, after excavating literally thousands of bones, we were um, able to name a new species of duck-billed dinosaur, which um, this was part of one of my graduate students' work project's work. And we named this dinosaur using some of the, the local Anupiaq language. And we named this dinosaur Agrunaluk kukpikensis. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, I worked with a native Anupiaq speaker. Um, and what this means is it roughly translates to the ancient chewer of the Colville River. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a neat um, combination of root words from Anupiaq the native people of that area. And this duck-billed dinosaur, as you can see, it was probably the most common large-bodied plant-eating dinosaur of this ecosystem. And in this artistic rendition here, you can sort of get a sense of, uh, in the foreground are some juvenile dinosaurs. They're probably, as juveniles, maybe nine, 10 feet long, but the adults were probably more like 25 feet long, over six feet at the hips. So pretty decent sized animal. And the painting also gives you a sense of the landscape at that time too. Um, it was a forested environment, very much contrasting to the flat treeless tundra of today uh, with conifers. In fact, the conifers would lose their needles. There were deciduous conifers um, under and um, broadleaf plants, shrubs, and an understory of ferns and horsetails. Next slide. And in the, you know, over the course of many years of collecting um, our museum primarily in conjunction with a couple other museums, we've, we've uh, amassed a, a body of evidence that shows that there were probably about 14 different kinds of dinosaurs that were living in the Arctic about 70 million years ago. And um, that being said, we might recognize that there's about 14 species, but only four of those have been given names. Those are shown in red. And the rest of them are basically, in most cases, too poorly known to be named. We don't have enough information to give them a name. Next slide. And so some of the work that we're, we're continuing to do is to basically find more evidence for the things that we know less about. We have a lot of bones of our Hadrosaur agrunaluk, and of the horned dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus. But we know precious little, especially about the meat-eating dinosaurs and some of the smaller plant-eating dinosaurs. So that's been the effort that we've been making for many years is finding new sites that have new information. Next slide. 
So to put some perspective here, the reason why uh, we go to great efforts and great lengths to study these dinosaurs is because um, these dinosaurs, as I mentioned, um, lived in the polar, polar regions. And globally speaking, polar dinosaurs are super rare. Uh, in the Northern hemisphere, the, the single best site for polar dinosaurs is the, the site I'm talking about on the Colville River. But there are a few other sites known elsewhere in Alaska, across Arctic Canada. But frankly, they're not producing that much in terms of bones and teeth. If you turn our attention to the Southern hemisphere and you look down in the Antarctica region, you know, bear in mind that in the Cretaceous period, Australia and Antarctica were actually joined. They separated during the Cretaceous. So Australia was very much a polar region, especially the Southern part of Australia. And there's a couple of sites there, one in particular called Dinosaur Cove that also produces polar dinosaurs. Um, but those, those bones are also not, there's not a lot of material. We even have some dinosaurs from Antarctica, but again, very little material at the end of the day. So polar dinosaurs are rare. And what's neat about them is they tell you when you, when you collect uh, and try to study dinosaurs, you know, studying the animals that lived at the environmental extremes is really informative and interesting. And that's why they're of great scientific interest. Next slide. So basically in a nutshell, um, in comparison to all these other polar dinosaur sites, the Prince Creek Formation is basically the best polar dinosaur site in the world um, because of the amount of material and the variety of different species and the kind of information it can provide. Next slide. So this is the kind of questions that, I, that we ask ourselves that we're trying to answer about these dinosaurs. And um, you know, the first question is pretty, not rocket science, it's, it's basically what kind of dinosaurs live there? Um, and we're not just interested in the dinosaurs, we wanna understand the ecosystem. So what are the kind of creatures are we finding um, that lived with dinosaurs like mammals or birds, um, flying reptiles, things like that? Who else is living there? And then one really important question is, uh, whatever those species are, how do they compare to species at lower latitudes? Are they the same species that we find in these really, really rich deposits in places like Alberta and Montana, or are they totally different species? Um, now, things I wanna focus in on this talk primarily, um, although I'll touch on those issues I just mentioned too, those questions, um, were they actually able to reproduce at high latitudes? And I'll tell you how high a latitude in just a second. And if they, if they could reproduce up there, were they migratory? Did they spend the whole year and endure the winter? Or did they get the heck out of there uh, during the winter months and migrate? Um, and there's another question we are discussing as well about warm bloodedness. I won't get into that discussion, but I'll just say that polar dinosaurs actually have a a unique opportunity to tell us a lot about dinosaur physiology as well. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, so here's the cool part. The whole reason why these dinosaurs are fascinating is the context around them, where they lived and when they lived. So these are dinosaurs, again, from about 73 million years ago. And if you look at a reconstruction of North American paleogeography from that time, um, what you see are a couple of really interesting things. First of all, the interior of North America was covered by a shallow seaway, which we call the Western Interior Seaway. And effectively, North America was split into uh, a Western portion we call Laramidia and an Eastern portion we call Appalachia. So you guys were over, you guys were over on Appalachia. Alaska was at the extreme North end of Laramidia. And in fact, intermittently was connected with Asia um, by a land, you know, what we like to call a land bridge. I'm not crazy about that term, but effectively, depending on sea levels, kind of like in the last ice age, North America and Asia were physically connected. Dinosaurs, we know, were able to move across that area, the area that is now Alaska. So really interesting stuff. Next slide. But the context about the environment is cool because North America and Alaska were farther north in the Cretaceous period than they are today. 
Now today, when we collect these dinosaurs, we're collecting them at about 70 degrees north latitude. So still a good distance north of the Arctic Circle, which is around 67. But in the Cretaceous period, Northern Alaska was as much as 80 to 85 degrees north latitude. It was practically at the North Pole. There were dinosaurs living that far north on our planet during the ice during the, the, the Cretaceous period, which is pretty remarkable just to know that. And then you wonder, well, okay, if it's that far north, how warm was it? And I won't get into the long story there, but effectively using plants as kind of like a paleo thermometer, we're able to understand that the average yearly temperature was around six degrees centigrade, which is like 43, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which means it wasn't nearly as cold as it is today, but it was cold enough to probably snow in the winter. And so there were freezing winter conditions likely. And that's what C CMMT means. That's the cold month mean temperature. Um, so in the coldest months of the year, it probably got below freezing, so below zero centigrade. Next slide. And so what's interesting is if you compare that, those, those types of information to lower latitudes, again, Alberta, Montana, like the Horseshoe Canyon formation, the paleo latitude, you can see it's much farther south and the average yearly temperature is much, much warmer than here in the Arctic. So not only does the Prince Creek Formation preserve the northernmost dinosaurs in the world, but it preserves them in a very unique and very sort of uncharacteristically uh, Mesozoic environment. It was a very relatively challenging environment for them to live in. Next slide. So having mentioned the temperatures, what I haven't mentioned yet is the most important factor that influences animals that live at really high latitudes. And that's seasonality, that's the day length and how that varies through the year. And Catherine would know this as a former Alaska resident that uh, living in the far north means we have long, dark winters. And this little graph here is basically just to say um, that if you lived at um, say 80 to 85 degrees north latitude, next slide, that you were gonna be experiencing some very long, dark winters if you were a dinosaur. And in fact, up to four months of complete winter darkness, if a dinosaur spent the winter there at all. So think about a dinosaur having to live four months complete winter darkness in probably freezing conditions. That's what makes the site so unique and these polar dinosaurs so interesting. But, um, but the question is, did they actually spend the winter there or not? If they did, they would have had to endure that. So again, looking at comparison here, you can see how much farther north um, the Prince Creek Formation is compared to other sites in the world. That's both Northern and Southern Hemisphere. Next slide. One of the repercussions of having a, um, yeah, a long dark winter, as I mentioned, is the extent, the extent of winter darkness. So 120 days or roughly four months of winter darkness. Um, next slide. If you think about that from a plant standpoint, which is the base of the food chain after all, um, the paleobotanists who have worked up here have sort of put together a scenario based on this light regime. And the, um, we're, we'll come back to this in a minute too, because what the, the idea is, if, if, there, um, if you were a plant living up there, essentially uh, you probably would have explosively grown new vegetation sometime in March, next. And then you would have had a very long, bright growing season at these high latitudes until about September and then next. Uh, by the time though that you hit October, you'd have a very rapid fall, dropping the leaves and boom, you're back into the winter environment. So that's the kind of world a dinosaur would have to live in, in terms of the food it would have had for resources. Next. And it's because of that, that people have long posited that, you know what, there's no way a dinosaur, a dinosaur is a reptile, right? How the heck is a dinosaur gonna live in an environment like that? They must have left for a long, there's been a long time now a migration hypothesis that, that dinosaurs, if they lived at any point of the year in the Arctic would have left in the winter months and undertaken a very long migration to lower latitudes to escape the cold temperatures and to find food. 
And you know, the comparison today would be with caribou. Caribou have the longest migration of any land living mammal. And they travel you know, upwards of a thousand kilometers a year. Um, and um, they do that not to escape the cold, but just to move to better food resources and for calving. Next slide. Now, alternatively, if dinosaurs didn't migrate, the other hypothesis that's been floating out there is they spent the winter and they toughed it out. And how they toughed it out, that's a whole nother question. But um, if they spent the winter up there, somehow they figured out a way to live in that cold and that dark. And um, so that's a pretty, that, that right there is a pretty interesting question. Um, and if they were year round residents, it would necessitate that they had to have reproduced in the Arctic as well. Next slide. And so that raises the question like, okay, let's just assume for a minute they could reproduce in the Arctic. How the heck did they do that? I mean, given all these crazy weather and, and climate. Um, and unfortunately, prior to our work, there was very little evidence to suggest dinosaurs were capable of reproducing at high latitudes. Next slide. Um, the only place that we really had to go on was a place in Russia, uh, Northeast Siberia called the Kakanaut Formation. It's not as high latitude, it was a warmer environment. But next, uh, we do have evidence for reproduction in the form of just a handful of scraps of dinosaur eggshell. Um, not a whole lot, it's a little hard to identify then the dinosaurs, um, but there seems to be at least two different kinds of eggshell and I think one is considered to be a duck-billed dinosaur and the other one might be some kind of a meat-eating dinosaur. But really that's the it for evidence for nesting at high latitudes. Next. What I'm gonna show you is the evidence we have now that shows that dinosaurs definitely nested in the Arctic. Um, and, um, and in fact, were year-round residents. And the evidence, next please, um, comes in the form of very small bones and teeth that we've been discovering through our kind of specialized excavations over the course of, of many years. And to give you some size of sense of scale of size, I mean, here are, you can see uh, some of these teeth and bones on a, on a penny. And just imagine you're holding a penny in your hand right now, and you're looking at some little black dot on that penny. Those are, you know, those are baby dinosaur bones and teeth, pretty remarkable. And what's cool is we found these remains, not just of one or two species, but of seven different families of dinosaurs, large species, small species, meat eaters, plant eaters, a lot of really interesting material. Next, please. Um, and the reason we found this stuff, frankly, came out of necessity. And that necessity is, well, um, these are places in Montana and Alberta. I've, I've worked in both places. Um, it's great, beautiful badlands, you walk around, you find bones laying on the surface. It's not like that in Alaska. Next. In Alaska, we have this. We have a river, cuts down, and it forms a steep bluff with some rocks exposed, and frankly, not very well exposed. And that's a very difficult place to find dinosaurs. There are no badlands up in the Arctic, and that's frustrating from us from a collection standpoint. Next. And um, so, um, yeah, so here's a, here's a few images of what it's like doing field work up in the Arctic. Um, so again, um, we get where we go first and foremost by flying. So we have to fly to our field sites. Generally we fly out of Prudhoe Bay, which is the big oil center up there. And we'll fly across the tundra next. And then we'll um, eventually, the there fortunately there's runways there's airstrips all over the place we call them gravel bars you don't really need an airstrip you can these gravel bars are beautiful places to land a plane especially if you have the big tundra tires um, and then we put together boats and we use the boats inflatable rafts with um, 35 horse outboard motors um, to get up and down the river and the rivers are, yeah the rivers are our highway next and um, we typically, in a summer when we're on the Colville, we usually cover about 75 river miles, which isn't really isn't that much. Um, but we carefully try to re-prospect different 
cliff areas that we that we know about as we as a as we work our way down the river. Next. Um, and then, yeah, essentially, in, in particularly in the lower part of our field area, we spend a lot of time um, prospecting areas along the beach, looking for bones that might be sticking out, or as often the case, bones that have fallen out of the cliff up above. And they land on the beach, and we look up longingly at the hill above us, and we go, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could get up there and find stuff? This particular site you can see us digging at actually is partway up a cliff. Next. And in fact, um, we get so desperate sometimes to find the stuff coming out in the cliffs up above our head that we do just rappel down the cliffs and we look for things that way. And actually it was through this kind of process that we actually discovered one of our important new sites um, that uh, led us to eventually do a winter excavation. I'll show you an image of that in a minute. Next. And what we've been finding is rather than we're not finding any more of these big bone beds full of just big chunks of large bones like, like we excavated from the Liscombe bone bed, where we found the most interesting information coming out of are what we call microsites. Um, and these are basically, next, these are just basically thin lenses of rock that represent the bottoms of stream channels where small bones and teeth accumulate. Next. And, um, uh, and I think there's one more in the slide next. Yeah, and what these little layers look like is really unremarkable, but the stuff that comes out of them is really, really cool because it preserves all of the small components of the ecosystem, the smaller species like fish and birds and mammals. And as this case turns out, baby dinosaurs as well. Next, please. Two of these sites uh, we found in the last few years, one's called Jacob's Bed, the other one's called Paul's Pearls. And yes, those are snowflakes we're collecting. And that's not the winter trip, that's the summer trip there with the snowflakes. Um, these two sites in particular produced a lot of really amazing stuff, which I wish I had time to tell you all about, but uh, we'll just focus on baby dinosaurs here. Next. <clears throat> And the way we collect out of these deposits is we excavate them in the field, kind of like a micro excavation, but most important is that sediment. We wash, screen wash on site the sediment and then take the sediment back to the lab. So here we are standing in just delightful weather, like 35 degrees and raining um, right along the banks of the river, spraying ourselves down with water to get uh, to basically wash the clay fraction out so we can just take the good stuff back. Next slide. And then here's the crazy part. It's very Alaskan. It's kind of like digging for gold. Um, we bring all that sediment back. We wash it and we wash it and we wash it. And then we pick every single grain under a microscope. Literally tens of millions of grains of sediment we look at under microscope, each and every grain, looking for fossils. And you know, it goes something like this, it goes rock, 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 oh, bone fragment. Okay, and you pull that up. Rock, rock, you know, you keep doing this. And so this is what undergraduate students were invented for. And so, uh, uh, I mean, these are, these are training opportunities for aspiring paleontologists. Um, and so uh, we have, uh, both in my lab and a couple of my colleagues' labs, we've had a couple of generations now of students who have picked sediment from these sites and found a lot of really, really cool stuff. Next, please. One of those sites um, is called OJ Soros. And the reason I just bring this up is that um, this led us to do some rather extreme things. We were so, so excited about the cool stuff we're finding in these beds. Um, next, please that we decided um, actually we, we, we really needed to get at this site. And, and you can see this site is about halfway up a cliff. And unfortunately the sediment above the, the cliff and the dig area is very unstable. And the only thing that holds us together is permafrost. And in the summer, the permafrost melts, the cliff becomes unstable and it can suddenly and catastrophically fail and kill you. We decided 
we like bones, but we're not gonna die for them. So what we said is if we wanna dig this particular site, we're gonna have to go there in the winter months when we can dig that layer without the cliff falling on us. So that's what we did. Next, please. And effectively, um, we did two winter digs on the North Slope, basically the coldest place in the United States of America in the middle of winter. Uh, we drove up to Prudhoe Bay, and then we took uh, snow machines out across the tundra all the way to our field site. Next, please. Um, we set up some specialized winter tents, and then we conducted an excavation of this bone bed. And um, the way we did this basically is we used jackhammers and special chainsaws to chop, chop out frozen blocks of rock that have the bone bed in it. And then we'd bring those back to the lab here in Fairbanks and clean them up. And if you take a close look at that thermometer, you know, people always, I don't know what it is, people always say when they want to say how cold something is, it's always, it's always 40 below. Every kind of time you see a documentary, oh, it's 40 below zero. It gets as cold as four. I don't know why that number is so popular. Um, um, and generally speaking, it generally isn't 40 below. This thermometer shows you that it's actually 50 below in this case. <laughs> and that's not a wind chill. So it was pretty cold. Uh, it can be quite cold. A good warm day is about 10, above, or 10 below zero. And that's actually very comfortable working weather, not a problem. Next. Um, and so these are the, some of the fruits of our labors. Uh, the, these are blocks of rock that we've excavated with those jackhammers and the chainsaws, all, all electric. Um, and um, we brought back, and over the course now of two field seasons, many, many blocks of, of frozen rock, which we've been steadily excavating here in the lab and finding more good stuff. Next. Okay, so what did we find? Well. Um, when we first started doing our microfossil work, um, we started to see some small bones. Now, when you find small bones, you might say, well, they, they might be small because the animal is young, or they might be small because it's a small species, right? Um, and in fact, we were finding small bones that, uh, that I'll ex explain here in a minute, seem to look like baby dinosaur bones. And um, next, please. And when you wanna know like how small, they're that small. So that is the head of a pin. A pin, the head of a pin is 1.5 millimeters across. That dinosaur vertebra, you can see for scale there is sitting comfortably on top of a head of a pin. So just picture holding a pin in your hand and a dinosaur vertebra comfortably sitting on top. Next, there you go, there's an even smaller one. So when we say these are small, there are no adult dinosaurs that are this small. <laughs> these have to be babies. Um, next, please. Um, and here's some more bones you can see. This is actually a leg bone. This is a femur, a thigh bone of a probably a ductile dinosaur, we're not sure, sitting on top of a pin. Next. So one of the best ways you can actually use to determine whether something's a baby or not is by making thin sections of the bone. So this is, this is a bone histology. So we can take the bone, we can make a thin section, put it on a glass slide, polish it down, look at it under a microscope and look at cellular detail. And baby bone is very different from adult bone. And what it has typically that's different is it's highly, highly vascularized. It's got a lot of blood vessels because the animal is growing rapidly. And that's what these openings on that, that reddish colored slide are showing. All those openings are blood vessels. There's a number of other more detailed features as well, but this is classic baby dinosaur bone texture. Next, please. So um, dinosaur bones are great, but as I mentioned there, we can only sort of coarsely say what kind of dinosaur, maybe a meat eater, maybe a plant eater. It's not very precise, but they're definitely baby bones and that's cool. If we wanna know what kind of dinosaurs were babies up there, we need to find tiny, tiny teeth. And that's what we also found. Here is a kind of a dinosaur, a tooth from a dinosaur called Leptoceratops. And it's a strange kind of relative of Triceratops, but much smaller as an adult. This is an adult sized tooth of a, a, 
a new species actually from the Arctic that we work on. And next, please. Next to it now is a baby tooth of that same species for comparison. Again, sitting comfortably on the head of a pin. Next, please. And if you magnify that tooth, um, you can see actually it's, it's, it's very distinctive. Like this is, this is a very distinctive kind of a tooth. We recognized who this is from right away. It's not, not really a mystery. Next, please. And we, um, this particular dinosaur is pretty bizarre because not only do we have baby teeth, but we have, it's an animal that has different upper teeth from lower teeth, they're recognizable. And we have baby teeth from both the upper and the lower jaws as well. Next. So how do we go about telling how big of an animal this was? Well, um, next please. Essentially, it's all comparisons. Now the dinosaur, that we have in the Arctic, Leptoceratops, um, is a very close relative of a dinosaur from Asia called Protoceratops that we actually have embryos from, that these are embryos, the, and we know they're embryos because the babies are still in the egg. So we know for sure that these Protoceratops um, are, are embryonic dinosaurs. And it's, a, it's an animal that is an adult, looks very much like Protoceratops in terms of size and body shape. And when we compare the size of our teeth with the size of teeth that are again, teeth still in the jaw, in the egg, next. Um, in fact, our teeth are smaller than that. <laughs> so it's really kind of hard not to explain this any other way than then that these, these teeth are actually from baby, not, not only baby dinosaurs, embryonic dinosaurs. Yeah. Next, please. And essentially we applied that same principle in comparisons with a variety of different teeth that we found in the formation. Here's our largest plant-eating dinosaur from a um, horn dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus. Here's an adult-sized tooth, next. And here is actually, um, in this case, this is not an embryo. This is more of like a baby-sized dinosaur tooth in comparison. And actually we have since found smaller ones. Um, so this is something next that we would call a young of year. It's, a, um, it's an animal that was less than one year of age. Next, please. Yeah, so this is more of a close-up. So this animal was probably like somewhere between seven and eight months old or somewhere in that frame. Next, we've even done this for the meat-eating dinosaurs up there. There's a really cool, but very poorly known and unnamed relative of a, dino, a dinosaur called Troodon. It's sort of a human size, as an adult, it's a human sized uh, uh, meat-eating dinosaur, kind of like the raptors in Jurassic Park. And we have teeth of this animal. We know it was a, a good sized adult. And now next, we also have baby teeth of this animal as well. Again, about a millimeter across, just tiny. Next, please. And next. Um, we even have the same thing for our one species of Tyrannosaur that occurred up there in the Arctic. This dinosaur has been named, it's called Nanuxaurus. Um, next. And we actually have, again, not, not babe, not embryos, but we have um, next, please. Teeth from individuals that, again, were less than one year old. Animals that certainly um, were, were, were born up there. They were not animals that could have moved any great distance before they died in this case. Next, please. And sort of the last thing on the fine side, we were finding um, all these baby bones uh, of, of baby dinosaurs, but then we started to find baby bones also of birds. And next, please. Um, one of the several bird bones actually are very distinctive as bird and not dinosaur. And um, in fact, um, we now have evidence for birds breeding in the Arctic. So the Arctic today is famous for its breeding bird colonies that come up from literally the other end of the globe to fly and nest in places like the, the, the tundra of, of the Arctic regions of the world. We now know that there were birds reproducing there as much as 73 million years ago. We have the oldest evidence 
for reproduction and avian reproduction in the Arctic as well at 73 million years ago. Next, please. So kind of bringing this all full circle, what does this tell us next um, about, about this question I brought up before about dinosaur migration? What can baby dinosaurs in, inform us about that? I mean, it's pretty cool to know they were nesting up there. And the fact that they did that is, is really remarkable. And it's not anything anybody was, was on anybody's radar. But knowing how much people have argued about dinosaur mi migration, when we thought about it, these baby bones have a lot to say about that question as well. And first and foremost, when you compare adult versus baby-sized dinosaurs, right away it's pretty obvious, next please, that baby dinosaurs in most these species, they were so small, there is no way in heck in the first year of their life, these animals were able to undertake like a thousand or 2000 kilometer migration to lower latitudes in order to escape you know, whatever kind of environment they lived in. They were just simply too small. There is no modern analog that would suggest they traveled, that, that they were capable of traveling that far at that body size. So that's just kind of, you know, reasoning that the, just a basic kind of reasonable assertion. Next, please. But one other really cool story that goes back to that timeline um, also really strongly supports the idea that dinosaurs were year round residents in the Arctic. So we saw this circle of uh, kind of the annual cycle before for the North Slope. So let's investigate that again. Um, next, please. Um, there was a study by my colleague here, Greg Erickson, um, who is my, my, one of my collaborators on this project in the Arctic. There was a study that he, he led a few years ago that was set out to determine the incubation periods for certain kinds of dinosaurs. In other words, how long did it take for a baby dinosaur to develop in the egg before it hatched? And they wanted to know if dinosaurs did what like birds do today, which is basically they lay eggs and they hatch out really quickly. Long story short, it turned out for two types of dinosaurs that they studied, there's our old friend Protoceratops again, and a duck-billed dinosaur, which is closely related to our species in the Arctic, that it actually takes them either three months in the case of Protoceratops or almost six months for those eggs to hatch. Dinosaurs are not like birds in this regard. Dinosaurs had really long incubation periods. Now, we know that dinosaurs were nesting in the Arctic. So let's think about our timeline here. So um, next, please. So I mentioned before, um, let's, let's, let's assume for a minute that dinosaurs were migrating. If they migrated, they would have had to have arrived as soon as it got light and the new vegetation began growing. They would have had to immediately have laid, dug a nest and laid eggs. Next, please. They would then um, have had to have done everything they did before the leaves fell and the darkness returned again, which would be about early October. Next, please. So in the case of that small leptoceratops we have, um, knowing that they would have spent about three months from egg laying before they hatched, it probably would have um, not been, these babies would not have been born until about the beginning of July. Next, please. And in the case of the duck-billed dinosaur, those babies wouldn't hatch out of the egg until literally about the time fall started. And um, if you think about it, that seems extremely unlikely that, in, that these dinosaurs could have had the time, just simply on the basis of time, to if, if they migrated, to, to migrate, arrive, lay their eggs, hatch their eggs, and then migrate out of there. There simply wasn't enough time to do that. Next, please. So we've been you know, led to the inevitable conclusion that these dinosaurs um, not only did they breed in the Arctic, they spent the entire winter up there. They had to because it would have been nearly impossible for them to travel um, uh, out of there and also reproduce in the same environment. Next, please. So going back to the original questions, I'm kind of wrapping up. Um, what did we know about the dinosaurs? What kind of dinosaurs lived in the Arctic? Next. Um, essentially, well, there's about 14 species. They were pretty diverse. Next. And um, part of the show, I didn't talk about this at all, 
we have evidence for about 10 species of fish, four to five species of mammals. We have new species of birds and possibly even flying reptiles. We've never found those bones before. That's all new information we've collected in the last few years. The Arctic was a pretty, pretty diverse, great place for, uh, for organisms 70 million years ago. Next. Um, I didn't get into this uh, too much, but so far, all of the dinosaurs we've been able to identify to species in Alaska are not the same species we find in Alberta and Montana. It seems as though the dinosaurs that lived in the Arctic were unique to that part of the world. Next, please. And of course, did they reproduce at high latitudes? Absolutely. Most, if not all species, we have evidence directly for seven of those 14, but probably all of these species of dinosaurs were nesting in the Arctic. Next, please. Leading us to believe that they were definitely year round residents. Um, next, please. Uh, finally, were they warm blooded? Well, I, again, another, another story, another time, but um, we have really, you know, really good data from more of this bone histology work we do to show that these dinosaurs in the Arctic grew as fast as their southern relatives did at lower latitudes, meaning they probably were also warm-blooded as well. And in fact, I think they would have had to have been to be warm-blooded to live up there at all. Next, please. So uh, just to wrap up, um, we're still working up there. We try to get up there every year. It's very expensive field work. It's about $30,000 to $40,000 a field season up there, uh, mostly air charter costs. It's not cheap. It's exhausting. Um, but we're looking at fossil footprints. We're looking at the paleobotany and the, the plants. And we're trying to answer questions about how the animals live there all, you know, during the course of the winter, because it was not an easy place to live. Next, please. So I'll just wrap it up and... Um, leave it open then um, to any questions and thank you for, for your attention. Well, I remember in DVD I know about Arctic dinosaur, some people thought they made a tunnel to dig some dinosaur bones, kind of like a gold mine only, they get bones. Yeah, yeah, um, so that field site- In Alaska. In Alaska, yeah, so that, that site, I'll just say that um, I was not a part of that project purposely. <laughs> Um, it was kind of a crazy idea, uh, but um, I was later given, um, I was asked to, um, to basically deal with that tunnel. Um, that tunnel was, uh, we did actually go back into the tunnel and we excavated some more stuff out of it, uh, but we, it was not a very good approach for digging dinosaurs up there. And so we did one season excavating in the tunnel and then we closed it up. And since then, it's been completely frozen in and it's no longer exists. So well, the tunnel well, is well, no more. Because I know they're trying to find where they get the bones without being damaged by the snow and ice and weather. Yeah. That we was the idea. Them. That was the idea is if you dug them out in, in the hill before they had a chance to freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, they would be in better shape. Didn't really work that way. Yeah. So that's part of the reason we're not adopting that strategy anymore. So the fact that you're finding all these baby dinosaur bones and teeth, was this a nesting site or do you kind of know what the remnants were, you know, what this was the remnants of? Yeah, you know, it would be nice if we had evidence of like nest structures or, you know, the, the actual areas that they were nesting the because of the nature of the deposit we're finding them in these are baby bones and teeth that that were transported by water probably not more than a half a mile at the most um, and deposited in this river channel so the actual nesting sites we have no we you know we've never found them um, they've eroded away and in fact um, we've never found a scrap of dinosaur eggshell and there's actually a really good reason for that. And that's because the soil chemistry up there, it's very acidic. And this is not a formation where one would expect eggshell to survive. It simply would have dissolved away over time because it's very acidic soils. 
I found it amazing. Um, thank you, by the way, today for helping out um, with that. I'm, I'm, I have so many questions. Was I know I having lived in Alaska, I know what the temperature is like and everything else in Anchorage and all that. But then you've got the a temperate rainforest. And I'm wondering if that could be what the area was like mm -hmm. during the Cretaceous, because that would make a little more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're pretty much exactly right. I mean, in, in, I mentioned those average annual temperatures for the North Slope in the Cretaceous were around, around 40, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And you mentioned temperate rainforest, Juneau, Alaska, this capital of Alaska, um, if, if for those of you who are not aware, in the southeastern panhandle, that's in a temperate rainforest. And guess what the mean annual temperature is of Juneau? It's about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a good analog, actually. Um, we don't think it was as wet, though, on the North Slope as like Juneau in southeast Alaska is, but, um, but it was probably certainly wetter than today. And so. I personally think you're crazy for have, doing a winter dig. <laughs> well, yeah. keeps me young. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you what, the winter dig, I found it, um, A, it was just a refreshing change. I'm a winter person anyway. Um, but the other thing about it that was really nice, well, no here's, mosquitoes. Here's, here's like three or four reasons. Uh, no mosquitoes <laughs> um, in the summer months. There are, um, uh, it, it's it's very muddy place to work. It's a it's a really really muddy place. So no mud. Uh, we don't have to use aircraft to get there in the winter. We can go out on snow machines, and um, and of course the big reason is you know the cliffs aren't falling on your head. So I actually find it to be a really enjoyable place to work in the winter, and I plan to go back and do that again. Are you seeing anything in the bones that would account for, for example, penguins raise their young and have their young up in, you know, bitter winter and all that. Is there anything that could be found from the bones that could parallel how penguins? Uh, good question. Um, in the sense that like the care of the pen, you know, or you're thinking well, like- I'm thinking of regurgitating food, bringing, you know, oh. the parents could be coming back and regurgitating for the young and the mm. one is keeping them somehow warm. Yeah, um, that's that's certainly possible. I'm sure there were ways that these, these you know, there there is evidence for parental care in dinosaurs from other places, especially Montana. Um, and so, yeah, there must have been some way that they were feeding or helping facilitate feeding by their young. But what those were exactly in this case, we're, you know, we're not sure yet. But I can imagine a little carnivorous dinosaur, you know, bringing, uh, bringing back some little, little mouse-sized rodents back to the, to the nesting area for dinner for the babies. That sounds reasonable. Sure. Donald has yeah, a question. Yeah, I had a question. Um... What are your theories on their survival over the dark four months? Yeah. The whole months, four months dark, plants break. I mean, they're on, there's no plant vegetation. It, it's gone. Right. Um, yeah. So um, how do they survive? Um, you thinking about hibernation? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what are they, could they be eating? I mean, right. you know? Yeah, that's, a, and that's, the, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, so in terms of the, the plant eaters, um, we have pretty big animals up like 25 feet long. We've got some species that were the size of like a, a terrier, not very big. I think it's possible that some of the smaller dinosaurs could have actually dug holes and hibernated. And in fact, the, there are close relatives to one of the small species of plant eaters we have. They're called Thesclosaurs. There's evidence, um, really good evidence that uh, a relative found in Montana actually dig it did, actually dug burrows and lived with its babies in the burrow. So I think it's possible, and someday we could maybe find and those are burrow. under warmer conditions, though the Montana. Well, well, well true. Um, and we don't know if those were hibernating, but we know at least they could burrow. 
Right. If our, if our dinosaurs could could also burrow and hibernate, and, and just to be clear, there's no evidence so far. No one's ever shown evidence that dinosaurs hibernated. But you know what? I think it's a totally possible, totally reasonable possibility. And I'd I'd love to find that evidence ourselves. So I think that's a possibility. But for bigger species of plant eaters, um, what they were eating could have entailed things like, well, they're doing basically what moose do today. They, it's amazing they survive where they do. Um, they're eating low quality forage and slowly starving through the course of the winter, but they have enough fat reserves and they can get some food nutrition out of, um, out of things like uh, you know, bark and twigs and um, in, in even things like uh, needles um, that, and perhaps even things like uh, shriveled up ferns that they could get through the winter. So but the babies what, wouldn't survive the winter. Well, the babies had to survive the winter. So presumably they were able to take advantage of those resources too. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. How they did that is really, we don't know the details. That's, that's kind of the, the next step in the study. You said the practical dog boards, right? Well, possibly. I remember on DVD a dinosaur egg and a baby. Robert Barker he believed could be a boar or a drinker and could be a nest. Do you think they could make a nest in there if they dug a boar? If they dug, you say, so if they're digging, you're saying could they could they dig nests? Yeah, you know, they, you know, they could build a nest in their boar. Oh, in a, in a bowl? Like you mean like a... No, a bar, you know, like a hole. Oh, know, like a bowl. yeah, I mean, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. I was just hoping a Wawa Barker fell, Pete found something like that in Wyoming, a group called Drinkos, and took it to a hospital to get a cat and see the lots of bones, all right. big and small and young and adults and juvenile and babies and embryos. Yeah, that's, that's what we're hoping to find. <laughs> I'd love to find yeah. that. <laughs> We well, another thing that would, I mean, I've driven the Alcan several times and I cannot imagine young dinosaurs making that trek. So, I mean, the migration theory, I think you're right. It, 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 it would be very difficult to imagine really small dinosaurs. I mean, in, in Africa, yes, the Serengeti, everything, it's very level. There, but not the Alcan. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the whole thing about migration is it's energetics. Uh, it's not worth doing uh, a migration if it's you know energetically costly. I mean, that's selection works against organisms that way. Um, and <laughs> so I think these animals obviously must have moved to some extent throughout the course of the year, but long distance migration is a commitment a species makes to like invest a lot of their energy into a long trek for a very usually specific purpose. And um, uh, yeah, so it's not something that a species does sort of lightly, right? Uh, <clears throat> and I think in this case, if you just think about how far a trek it would be for these dinosaurs to have just made it to the Paleo Arctic Circle, much less to someplace south of the Arctic Circle, it's a really long distance. We're talking a two to 3,000 kilometer round trip journey every year, beginning from the time that they're this big. Hard to swallow. Are you getting any comparisons from the dinosaur information from Antarctica to compare to your own on the migration or living in that environment? I missed the very first part of your question, but I, I think I got your question mostly. Um, so the evidence, there is some evidence for baby dinosaurs in the Southern latitudes, but, but not nearly as at high a latitudes as, as we're looking at in the Arctic. Um, so there is a little bit of evidence there, um, but it doesn't unfortunately really say too much about migration in that, in that particular instance. In fact, they're not even really sure what those probable baby bones are from, what kind of species they're from, probably a small herbivore, but I don't know if they fully answered your question though. Yeah, I think he kind of did. I know Leanosaurus, I think, stayed in place in, in the Antarctic Australia area. Yeah, yeah. They, probably a relative of something like that, that that they have bones of now. 
Alan Keith has a chat question. Um, sure. Are there fossil record of uh, dinosaurs between the baby age and adults? That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we do have that. Um, there are, um, we have a really a range of bones. We do, we seem to have like a lot of just that, that what we call perinates, those babies that were either embryos or just hatched. Um, and, but we do have larger growth stages as well. And in fact, the best thing we have is that big duck-billed dinosaur that I mentioned, a Grunelik. Um, we have a lot of, um, particularly, we have more juveniles than we do adults by a long shot. So, and those are animals that were probably about two to three years of age based on what we can determine. Um, so, uh, yeah, for the duck-billed dinosaurs, we do kind of have a growth, a growth series um, and a little bit so for the, the Pachyrhinosaurus but we just don't have enough information for some of those other species to say a lot. Have you had enough fossil record to do histology on some of the bones? Yeah, yeah, and that's the, um, we did the growth series, uh, histology growth series on, on Agrunaluk um, from pretty small individuals up and we can actually determine, um, it looks like they were reaching maximum body size by about the time they were 17 years old. And at that time they were, were estimating they're around 25 feet in length, um, but they grew very rapidly in an early stage, like teenage years. Um, so that's one of our really good evidence for the warm bloodedness is, is from that histological kind of study. I've got a question as it relates to the um... I mean, any animal living up in that area now has to have a lot of hair to keep warm, obviously, and stuff. But back then, uh, temperatures were higher. But would there be, I mean, is there still enough uh, insulation on the body to keep warm? Or, or how did they keep warm if they didn't have hair and uh, even at temperatures in the 40s, I guess? Yeah, the the insulation thing is important. I mean, we we um, yeah, they wouldn't have had hair, but what we do know is almost certainly all of the meat eating dinosaurs had feathers. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about the meat eaters, we can confidently say they had feathers, even though we have not directly found evidence at this site. There's an abundance of evidence from theropods elsewhere that shows that to be the case. The question is more about what did the plant eaters do. We don't have great evidence for feathers in plant-eating dinosaurs. Um, we, they, they potentially, and they seem to have had the capacity for feathers. Um, so maybe Arctic species were just as feathered as the meat eaters. Um, we don't know. And um, besides like external insulation, you know, it's, it's entirely possible they would have had uh, a fairly thick layer of blubber or fat stores that could have also helped them, um, you know, maintain some warmth as well. So that's another thing we would love to find some direct evidence for. Um, but um, cetacosaurs from China have been shown to have they kind do. of downy feathers, right? So those well, are the Ceratopsia. Yeah, they kind of have these kind of like they have weird, weird looking feather like structures. People have debated what they are. They're more bristle like. And um, there's been some other work that's shown that very likely um, feathers were probably primitive for all dinosaurs, but we happen to have a really good fossil record of feathers in the meat eating group, but less so for most of the plant eaters. And it may have just as much to do with the fact we just haven't found as many great fossils of them. I, I personally think that because of things like cetacosaurs, and other types of evidence that they probably were feathered, but um, that'll get more supported as, as finds are made elsewhere in the world of feathered plant-eating dinosaurs. I'm kind of looking forward to those discoveries that are gonna happen eventually. Well, if you think about walruses, I mean, it's their, their fat that keeps them warm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great insulator, it works. So if they could put on a layer of, 
of fat and have say even featherless, you know, scaly skin, that might have done the trick. Any correlation with what's being done as far as studying down in the Antarctic with what you guys are doing? Yeah, well, first of all, I'll just say I, I want to go to the I'd love to do field work down there. So maybe someday I'll get a chance <laughs> to do that. Some of my colleagues, I have colleagues that work down there. Um, you know, the, the best Antarctic dinosaurs people are aware of, there's one called Cryolophosaurus. It's a big carnivorous dinosaur that was found in the Antarctic Peninsula. It was a remarkable find, but it's found from the Jurassic during a much warmer period. And, um, you know, it's an amazing, it's an amazing find. Uh, it, it it doesn't say anything about dinosaur reproduction, and it it, um, it it seems though that there are some similarities in that being a very high latitude site, probably having to deal with those same kinds of winter darkness conditions as well. Um, but there's not a lot of that material, unfortunately. There's also some dinosaurs from the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, there's a couple of islands that have some cool Cretaceous rocks. And those have produced some interesting um, dinosaur bits as well, but it's um, it's been pretty fragmentary so far. What about um, other deposits? Are there are there um, rock formations of different ages? Um, I, I remember reading about like around the time of the uh, Paleo Eocene global thermal maximum that mm -hmm. it was very very warm in the Arctic. Would that yeah. have been much warmer than these periods? Yeah, the that the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum was much warmer than the warmth that we were seeing here um, in the in the late Cretaceous. So the you know we think of the Cretaceous as a pretty warm period of Earth history, but the that PETM we call it is like kind of off the scale warm for a very short period of time geologically. Um, we do have actually rocks in Alaska from that from that interval about fifty five million years ago. And we had palm trees in Alaska. <laughs> That's how warm it was. <laughs> I have uh, in our collection, we have a two meter wide palm frond from that period of time in Alaska. Wow. Palms in Alaska. Mm -hmm. That, by the way, is now on display at the Smithsonian in their new fossil gallery. So if you want to see it, you have to go to DC. <laughs> and that would have been subject to the same darkness periods, right? As, as the period you're talking about. Um, not as much. No, actually, by then, Alaska had actually moved considerably farther south. And mm. those deposits that where the palm fonds are, they're not quite as far north as northern Alaska. So they would have been more like maybe low 60s in latitude, but not up in the 70s, 80s. Okay. Still pretty remarkable, though, how warm it was. Yeah. Well, at this at this point, I'm going to stop recording, but Great. that doesn't mean um, if Patrick is available, stop asking questions. Oh, he just oh, there. look at that cute cat. Yeah, she's here for you. So, I know, it's so cute. I, I I can't even imagine what it must have been like when you first started finding them and and proposing that there.